there's questions for Paul. Paul, what's, what's your take on the difference between reactive um, and passive flood measures? Um, because from ourselves in the flood industry, I think, speaking on a number of people, um, we've, seen, we've seen a big shift um, to more passive measures rather than the reactive. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, it's horses for courses. Um, if you've got, you know, one of our big bugbears is the big heavy flood door that goes in with an old lady. Okay? Uh, people on holiday and so on. There are situations for both. One of the issues for, for example, passive doors and so on is they've really only started to come on the market in the last few years. I think there's still quite a long way to go for the industry to get up to the mark in terms of stopping to think about the product and starting to think about the service that they're delivering. Right? There's a huge gap, I think, because how can you expect how can you expect a little old lady who's 70 or whatever to understand the property flood risk market? Yeah? Well, okay, Nigel. Nigel, maybe we have exceptions. Okay. Eight, okay, 80. Nevertheless, we shouldn't expect it, okay? Or me, for that matter. But it's, it's actually about the service we deliver and the, and the, res what is it, the, the residual risk that we're leaving. Yeah. Uh, that I think we need to be focusing on. I think the industry as a whole needs to get to be not so worried about whether it's passive or, 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 or active and be focusing on that cradle-to-grave approach. Can I just add to that? Uh, while uh, the challenge is, uh, remains with manufacturers and getting this right, I think yeah, there, there is some difference in, in the sense that when you look at the actual, the actual benefit and the potential for uh, once a defence is not permanently there, then it needs an operation. That means human beings need to do something that bit scary. So the, 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 the actual uh, reliability of making, you know, getting you know, the, flood, the flood being forecast, uh, someone being told it's happened, uh, someone putting something there, actually being at home to do that, uh, getting it right. Normally you might be doing it during the time it's wet and all that. Yeah, there are all those things. Uh, if you don't have to do anything, uh, then that helps. But having said that, there are also issues that come with uh, uh, passive things, because the fact that you don't have to do it and you just rely on it and assume it's there, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, that will work on us. I, think, I don't think that there's, one is better, but in terms of taking out some of those operational risks, uh, I, I can see a reason why a passive one, you know, might be worth doing. But at the same time, it still needs to be, it still to be suitable for the people who are using it uh, for, for that to happen. No, I agree. So, we manufacture both, so. <laughs> uh, Fowler, you, you, you finished your presentation with it starts with vision and leadership. And Paul, you quite rightly showed a lot of what's being done down at the very local level and a lot of valiant activity there. Um, but we've got a government that spends 30 times as much as it spends on flood defense on foreign aid, most of which is wasted. It, surely it's got to come up the government agenda. And how on earth do we do that without the Thames flooding the Houses of Parliament? I could engineer that to happen. <laughs> could we engineer it? <laughs> I, I, I think we all know that we're not spending enough on flood risk management, and, and, and the statistics board just puts down suggest that. And I guess people in hospitals and schools and everyone will say that, but the reality is we know uh, even if we had a talking increase, we are just so way off, off that. But I think leadership is very important. Sometimes, as happened... When I, when I compare the New Orleans approach to the Sandy approach, showing leadership sometimes, it just helps set a direction. It helps get people going. It helps inspire sometimes. Sometimes that's all you need to do. Again, if I compare post-2013-14 uh, flooding here, I was a lot involved in helping, you know, delivering the, the restoration of a lot of failed defenses 
trying to get them done within a year before the next winter comes. The problem was that the government was so concerned you had to get it back to what it was and nothing more. Even when there was a clear opportunity that this place is, it's been decided that there's a scheme that needs to be done here, this case you're going to increase it and all that. While you're there, a little bit just to deal with that or do something to make that a bit better or do something different that provides other, was just not on the cards. Again, you look at the leadership from, 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 New, uh, uh, from, from the U.S., they said, we can do that. But while we're doing that, quality of life is important. All the other things, we'll actually use this as an opportunity to create something better. And I think sometimes that's where leadership comes in. In addition to that, I think we need to recognise that we ain't going to get large sums of money. Uh, coming in, and we actually need to think about how we work. We need to think clearly about new partnerships, people that you would not normally think of collaborating with. We need to think about what's our actual role and how, how can we help improve the situation by going into partnership in different ways with other people. We need to think about innovation in the sen sense of what haven't we thought of? What can we learn from examples, for example, Fola gave in terms of doing things in different ways? So, for example, we've just got a bid in, bid decision due out in the next couple of weeks. We're for an interreg bid with the Rivers Trust. They're doing the catchment based approach, we're doing the community bid. Okay? It's not a partnership we've ever dealt with before, but we recognise that actually working together, we are likely to go and be able to deliver a lot more than if we'd uh, gone on our own. And we'll probably you know, better chance of getting the bid as well. But it's, um, we've got to think in new ways and we've got to seek new ways of actually working together. Thanks. A question at the back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fowler. Uh, for a city like New Orleans, is there any uh, kind of thinking that we have to start thinking of a point of departure where all the resilient solutions and all the measurements will fail to prevent such events that happen in New Orleans? Uh, I mean, is there any uh, feasibility taking account to a point of a departure, a, a, a point where we can do nothing, even the resilient measurement? city like New Orleans, uh, if it faces the same events, maybe the next two years, what are the measurements that can prevent such events? Uh, taking people life, hundreds of people life. I mean, city like uh, the one uh, in Russia affected by the Chernobyl uh, incident. That's it, city closed, people are leaving, searching for an alter alternative. For a city like New Orleans, in, uh, witnessing such devastating impact of flood, is there any thinking of a point of a departure? I guess like everything else, uh, this is about making the place more resilient, reducing their risk, uh, and recognizing that if you do it in a sustainable and resilient manner, working with more resilient systems, what actually happens is as it gets better, as you get the perhaps above event, some event beyond what you've done, the way that the whole thing fills up and then fills is that it fills in a way that it doesn't just fill catastrophically, and it's coming. It's not something that's just hidden away somewhere, and suddenly there's this big wall and it collapses, and you've got a two-foot uh, uh, wave uh, you know, heading at you. So I think it recognizes that it's still doing it to a standard, but it's the way that that happens is visible. The way the system interacts allows that not to happen as often, and then when the real big event happens, it's already designed in, you know where it's gonna happen. It just outflows into an area where it's okay to go into that area. So the whole thing is controlled, and, and that is, is there. It's not about trying to design everything, because at some point there will be a weak point. Designing that is actually designing to be sure of where that weak point is, so that you can actually manage it and have a contingency plan. And I think that that is the way that, that they're, they're looking at it. And that, to me, is the way you deal with resilient things. Because something will always come that will be bigger that, that, than what, you, uh, what, what you've designed. One of the things I think we've not done that well in this country is to sometimes think about those people who get flooded most often and whether they're actually underlying strategic issues that... Uh, 
You know, we often tend to confront things piecemeal. And uh, one of the challenges, the bit where we've got to innovate, the bit where we've got to work better in, in partnership across sectors and so on, is first of all working out where those places are and then thinking and coming up with much more innovative solutions than, than we currently use. So. Okay. My question might go to Foga. How do you think that risk and resilience are related? Sorry? How do you think that risk and resilience are related? Risk and resilience? Yes. Oh dear, that is an academic uh, uh, thing that I can spend yeah. years. Uh, Do you want to think about that and Ched will ask a supplementary? Yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for excellent presentation. When you showed this uh, diagram of uh, Rebecca Brown and uh, Tony Wong, I have a very similar one. It is an excellent example of how these things are evolving. Such concept comes somewhere in between. Yes. Uh, before the, uh, as I mentioned this morning, that uh, that uh, concept of uh, uh, urban, uh, so so what is nice urban design, which you yes. kept mentioning, is superseding the gradually, yes. and then blue green is superseding what is nice urban design. Yes. For example, the question will be: Are you ready to think of that way? So the next time when you do something similar to Hoboken, yeah. for example, all these green infrastructure which you're putting there in place, which is excellent example, yes. they are doing some other things in addition to just flood aviation. Yes. But these green things, if slightly different, they can also do reducing air pollution, yes. reducing noise, yeah. uh, urban farming. Heat Island is already kind of there, but it can be energy efficiency of buildings, these three can significantly reduce the consumption. Of the, so there are a lot of other functions which can be added if they are done at the same time when you are designing, redesigning. And you have yeah. done it excellently for one or two or three of these, yeah. but there are five, six, seven, eight others yeah. which can be done. Are you ready? I'm ready to work with you on the next Woken that does have some other place where yeah. we can demonstrate. Yeah. It is not flood resilience only. Flood yes. resilience, we spend the money, but by the same money or a little yeah. bit more money, you can hit many other issues. And yeah. with the one plus one is not two, yeah. it's three, four, five, six, whatever. Yeah. So that's what, uh, what I meant this morning when I spoke yeah. about the wise man solution. You spend much less money and hit many other. The question is, are you ready? I guess you will say yes, but. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I, I, I think within the project, the idea was to, to capture as many of that, but also to, to, to allow the hook to be there for, for, for the other things to happen. Uh, and now the idea is that people are then starting to link those so that if the next thing happens, you've already thought through that. Obviously, you had to think through that in the short term, but yet it's really nearly moving from a perhaps a water-sensitive city to a, a, a real a blue-green city, even. <laughs> There's a, something that's always bothered me a little bit, actually, is whether in Britain the way that we have organized our local government and so on actually makes that much more difficult than in some other places. And I, th I wonder if that's a structural issue that we really have to address. Yeah. It's interesting, actually. I mean, after uh, uh, the peak review, I mean, the idea was to, to look at the structures. And we agreed then that just when you did a diagram of all the, all the structures around flood risk and water management, it was crazy, and they looked at it, and the idea is that that should get uh, streamlined, but all that happened was people were told to communicate more with each other and share information with each other, and the system is still exactly what it was. So it is a challenge, yeah, we are the most complicated uh, system, and the only thing we've been able to do about it is say, well, we keep it that way, we just talk a bit more, and I think we could go a lot further. Uh, uh, perhaps the whole, an opportunity might be what's happening now where cities are starting, you know, looking more towards divorced cities, mayors and all that. Because I think what the kind of things that happened in Hoboken actually meant that the departmental silos, when you have a mayor, someone like that in a city, it actually sometimes breaks through that. So it depends, if a few of those kind of people have the ambition and show the leadership, I actually think that they stand a better chance of delivering things than through the normal government departments, which, are, which is just so many of them. OK, I think we've got, if anyone has a final question or comment or wants to answer the risk and resilience <laughs> one, I do think that would take a little bit of time. But uh, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, I think, would be my answer. That's, um, <laughs> but uh, OK, if we've come to, a, I think, a natural end, we've had a, a great uh, 
a great debate and discussion at times today. Thanks again, Paul and Fola, for your answers there. Thank you. Um, so I'll just kind of draw it to an end, just remind you to uh, please fill in your feedback forms. So thanks for joining us for Resilience 15. We look forward to welcoming you back next year. Look out for further information on that. And if you have ideas of what you think we should cover then, please put them in the feedback forms or feel free to contact us, the SEMA and the events team at any time uh, to, to give us your feedback. So thanks very much and uh, final round of applause for everyone.